Let's pray together, shall we? Lord, it is such a privilege to be able to sit in freedom and to hear your word read to us. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the scriptures that have so many things to teach us. And we thank you, Lord, for the story from Luke's gospel today. As we think and ponder upon it, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds and that your spirit would speak to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I wonder if you have ever been in isolation uh, from your loved ones. Have you ever had to be separated uh, from family and friends for any length of time? Um, the answer for many of us, uh, pre-2020, uh, I guess, would have been no. Uh, we haven't really had to have any time of isolation. We haven't had to um, be apart from our family and friends for any length of time. But one of the impacts of COVID-19 uh, and the pandemic on all of us was to subject us to an enforced separation from those who we would normally have been able to meet with uh, freely and regularly. And, and perhaps for some of us now, those times of lockdown are something perhaps of a distant memory. Uh, and yet, when we think back to that extraordinary time in our lives, we can think of those uh, dark days when we were unable to meet and to share as we once did. I don't know about you, but there was a, a, a tangible sense of uh, relief, but also gratitude uh, for me when we were once again able to uh, meet with people, uh, friends and loved ones. But we carry around, don't we, uh, the experience, the memory of just what it was like to be separated and, and, and isolated uh, in that way. Our gospel story this morning is the account of the healing of 10 lepers. And if we know anything about the disease of leprosy, we know how devastating it can be on an individual, not just because of the physical impact upon a person, but also because of the social exclusion which accompanied anyone who was unfortunate enough to contract this disease. Our story today reminds us of a time when the world existed in a pre-scientific age, a time down through the ages when there were countless numbers of people who were subjected to all kinds of illnesses and diseases, that thankfully, because of the expertise of uh, scientific and medical communities, we need not fear the impact of any more. Uh, leprosy in the ancient world was one of the most feared diseases uh, as it removed an individual from living out their life in the community, whilst at the same time tearing at the body, causing infection and mutilation. In Jewish society of the day, uh, that placed a heavy emphasis on being clean, uh, in other words, ceremonially clean, um, which was, in essence, another way of saying that someone was acceptable uh, to the community, leprosy brought with it the label of unclean. And the Jewish law was very precise and exact about anyone who had such a label. Lepers could not come within a certain distance of someone who was clean, uh, and indeed, well into the Middle Ages, uh, people with leprosy had to wear special clothing to mark them out. Some even wore bells to announce their arrival, and others would shout out the word unclean ahead of them as they walked at a distance, begging for contributions that they could find. It was a miserable existence. Uh, for people who saw little hope in the future, and because such people knew a shared life experience, bonded into small leprosy communities, 
in which all kinds of barriers of race and class and sex and language disappeared and only the dreadful disease of leprosy brought them together. That's why we hear in our gospel story today that one of the lepers was a Samaritan. Um, now, as we said before, uh, when we hear the word Samaritan today, perhaps we think of the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus' story there, uh, or we think of uh, today the Samaritans, the organization. But we rarely think about the animosity and the hatred that existed between Jews and Samaritans because of their long, checkered history. But in this instance, that seems to have been forgotten. And the great leveler of leprosy, uh, which was almost always a death sentence, uh, has brought one's sworn enemies together, to live together, to exist together because of this disease. The account of the healing of the ten lepers has been described as a story in two parts. It begins uh, with a healing story, uh, as all and, and has all of the elements of a healing story. Uh, there is the cry of help. Jesus, Master, have pity on us from the lepers. Jesus responds by telling them to go and show themselves to the priest, as was the custom. And we also find that the healing seems to take place without any physical contact uh, between Jesus and the lepers. Uh, as we read in the, in the scriptures, as they went, they were cleansed. The healing, the cleansing seems to have taken place on their way uh, to go and show the priest that they were indeed healed. And then the second story develops. And it's about an account of the salvation of a foreigner. Jesus' questions, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? All of those questions highlight one of the major themes in Luke's uh, writings, uh, that it is the Gentiles the Samaritan, the outcasts, and the sinners who respond enthusiastically to the offer of the good news of salvation. To those who feel that they deserve it, uh, to the religious, to the proud, who assume their piety guarantees their salvation, they don't return because they do not see a need to seek forgiveness. The Samaritan foreigner is the only one who comes back to give thanks to God because only he recognizes his sin and his need to turn back to God. There's something here of a parallel in the Old Testament uh, and the story of Naaman the Syrian, uh, which is found in 2 Kings in chapter 5. You can go home and read it uh, um, later on. And who is healed of leprosy? The only one in Israel who is so cured. A Syrian and not a Jew. And indeed, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, in, uh, in Luke, uh, as recorded in Luke chapter 4, he causes outrage in the synagogue by referring to this story in Nazareth. And such was the, the parochial nature of the people there um, that the mere mention of someone from another tribe, another race, another people, uh, turns their blood to boiling. Uh, and Luke tells us that the people in the synagogue were furious. They drove Jesus out, taking him, on the bra taking him onto the brow of a hill to throw him down. But Jesus walked through uh, safe and sound. One of the things that does seem to come across as we read the accounts in the New Testament is the thought that um, the Jews saw God as just God for the Israelites. Uh, but as we know, right from Old Testament times, the prophecies that the good news uh, of the Messiah was not just to be for one particular people, but all peoples and all nations, so leading to a state of thankfulness uh, for God's gracious love for all humankind. Because that is what, at the heart of this passage from Luke 17, 
this is all about, namely gratitude and thankfulness, something of a theme that we are picking up today. We've asked some questions already in, in our, our short talk earlier, uh, but let me ask you again, how often do we stop and think about what we have, what God has given to us, and then give thanks to God? How often do we stop and thank God for good health? Perhaps only when something goes wrong and our, uh, with our health. Uh, do we think about it? Maybe asking God, why has such a thing happened to me? When we're fit and healthy, we tend to forget to say thank you for a measure of good health. But what about thanking God for his provision that the Lord bestows upon us? How often do we stop and think, ponder and say thank you? Yes, at harvest time, we do that uh, each year. Uh, but what about at other times? When else do we say thank you to God for his provision? Do we say thank you to God for our homes, our families, our friends, our places of work and leisure, um, the food that we enjoy, the safety and the freedom that we know? Indeed, for all of life and all of its experiences, its opportunities and its challenges. Now, I'll be very honest with you uh, that I am preaching to myself this morning as much to anyone else uh, that's gathered here today because I'm not always as thankful as I should be. And I know that. Um, but some, some, sometimes I do catch myself sometimes thinking about, about what the Lord has given to me. And it's then that this immense wave of gratitude and thankfulness sweeps over me and I can express that in prayer, in praise, in worship to God. Indeed, how often are we thankful to God for what he has done for each one of us? Indeed, the entire world in and through his son, Jesus Christ. Well, maybe that's uh, is something that we are a little bit better at doing because we gather each Sunday, don't we, to bring our praise and worship and our thankfulness, our thanksgiving to God uh, for his great love for all of creation and all that Jesus has done for each one of us. You see, the Samaritan uh, coming back to Jesus, praising God, uh, we find a picture of true thankfulness and gratitude when we read these words, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. Picture that for a moment. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And then we hear those words. And he was a Samaritan. Such a picture is wonderful indeed, indicating a, a humble, a contrite, grateful and thankful heart but then with this added description of who he is. And that would have been surprising, shocking even, to the original readers who were reading Luke's gospel. Because as we've said, uh, there was animosity between Jews and Samaritans. And yet, in this account, uh, we find that it is the historical sworn enemy, if you like, who has come back to say thank you. In some senses, it's a reversal of the story of the Good Samaritan, isn't it? Where it was the Samaritan who had mercy in Jesus' story on his sworn enemy, the Jew, um, taking care of him, looking after him, making sure that he had everything that he needed, treating him with respect. Uh, and here it is in the person of Jesus, the Jew, who is giving aid to the Samaritan, uh, healing him of this life-limiting disease and restoring his place within society. We must not forget that that is what happened for this man. He was restored in the society that had shunned him, that had wanted nothing to do with him. He found life once again 
And there could really only have ever been one response to such a, um, a healing, such a gift coming to an individual. Thankfulness and gratitude, joy, praise, and relief, all wrapped up in this one experience. But like Jesus, perhaps we ask, what about the other nine? Well, the straight answer to that is that we just don't know. But we're not told that their healing is reversed. It's not subject or conditional upon their returning. They just do not come to Jesus thanking God for what he has done for them. And again, it highlights this fact that the good news seems to touch those whom we would least expect it to touch. And in this case, the Samaritan. Yes, the other nine were healed, and no doubt their, their healing was genuine and long-term, but it appeared not to spark within them that sense of gratitude. In other words, they did not receive the fullness of what the Lord was offering, wholeness of life in Jesus Christ through faith, because that's what the final pronouncement uh, in our reading is uh, all about. When Jesus says, rise and go, your faith has made you well. If you are reading it from the authorized version, uh, we hear, your faith has made you whole. See, all of the ten lepers had been cleansed of this debilitating disease, but only one found wholeness in life, the Samaritan, the outsider, because of his faith, in God, expressed in thankfulness and gratitude. Uh, Tom Wright, um, in his commentary on Luke's gospel, uh, compares Jesus' closing words uh, to the Samaritan uh, with the story of the prodigal son uh, and the man who was lost, saying this, this man was dead and is alive again. New life had arrived in his village that day, and it had called out of him a faith that he didn't know he had. Faith here means not just any old belief, any generally religious attitude to life, but the belief that the God of life and death is at work in and through Jesus, and the trust that this is not just a vague general truth, but that it will hold good in this case, here and now. This rhythm of faith, he goes on to say, and gratitude simply is what being a Christian is about in the first century and also in the 21st century today. In other words, we too are to have that same faith and gratitude and thankfulness in equal measure as we continue to learn what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ in this our day and time. Perhaps as we close, we can do no better than to hear the words from the psalmist again, some of the words that we heard from our reading earlier in our service that Jill read to us, something for us to reflect upon and to give thanks to God for. It says this, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Praise the Lord, my soul. Amen.